All right. Good evening. Thank you for joining uh, this evening's webinar, Camping, Camping Along the James, presented by the James River Association. My name is Justin Doyle, and I'm the James River Association's Community Conservation Manager, and I'll be moderating tonight's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce uh, some of my James River Association colleagues and our special guests. Um, I'd like, also like to provide an overview of uh, what we'll be talking about during tonight's webinar. Um, so to begin with, uh, we are joined with, joined by a handful of my awesome colleagues at the James River Association. We've got Jamie Brunko, uh, Julia Carson, Charles Johnson, and Mason Manley. And we've also got a special guest, Andy Thompson of Riverside Outfitters. We're, we're very fortunate to have Andy with us this evening. And so tonight we're gonna um, talk to you about camping all along the James. We're gonna provide you with an overview of uh, Virginia's beautiful James River. Uh, we're gonna talk about different types of camping. We're gonna talk about glamping. For those of you who don't know what glamping is, this is gonna be um, you know, an opportunity for you to learn about this new trend in camping. We're gonna talk about uh, the James River Leadership Expeditions, a program for high school students who reside in the James River watershed. We'll give you some tips on planning a multi-day expedition on the James, and we'll present to you some tools uh, that'll help you plan um, some camping adventures, uh, hopefully this spring, summer, and fall. Uh, and we'll conclude the webinar with uh, a question and answer session. And I encourage you, um, as we uh, are talking about camp camping along the James this evening, to answer your questions and comments into the Zoom chat box. Um, and we will do our best to answer um, any questions received uh, at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Jamie Bronco, um, to talk about the James River. Jamie, take it away. Thanks, Justin. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, yep, my name is Jamie Bronco. I am uh, JRA's advocacy manager and James River Keeper. So I oversee a lot of our, our policy and, and environmental monitoring oriented type of work. Um, and it's a real treat to talk to you about camping. Um, this isn't really something that's in our job description, but something that's really unique about J James River Association staff is that we, we each um, spend time on the river and it's sort of a unique knowledge base that we're able to acquire through our jobs. And again, it's just a treat to, to be able to share a little bit of insight um, from our personal experiences tonight about how to have a really great uh, camping trip on the James. Go ahead and hit the next slide, um, Justin. So I'm gonna introduce some things to you just to give you a sense of the landscape. Um, some of you may be very familiar with the James some of you not so much. And so I wanna give you a little bit of background on the geography, um, on, on the natural assets that we have in Virginia here. So um, the James starts way up in the, the Allegheny Highlands, flows through the Blue Ridge, through the rolling hills of the Piedmont, and then finally into the coastal plain, the sandy soils, and into the Chesapeake Bay. An incredible amount of diversity um, along the way in terms of the landscape um, the types of wildlife that you'll encounter, and of course, the types of experiences that you're going to have if you're spending time outside, either in a boat, in a tent, um, or if you're glamping, if you're doing some, some more upscale um, camping outside. Um, these are all photos from, from personal experiences that staff have had out on the river, and um, that's a mink over there in the top right corner. Believe it or not, you can see mink running along the riverbank in the Upper James, and in fact, Justin and I um, who have been friends since um, since middle school. We've had numerous paddle trips in the Upper James where we've seen these little guys run along the banks. It's pretty cool. Um, river otters, um, really amazing spring uh, wildlife when things start sort of emerging from the winter time. Um, it, it's it's always amazing what you can encounter um, and how distinct these three regions really are um, across Virginia. Go ahead and hit the next slide, Justin. Again, to to help orient you. I think a map is always helpful. This is um, uh, gives you a little bit of the sense of the topography. Again, the mountains um, is where we, we start off with the Upper James. We've got those um, those uh, Piedmont rolling hills, and then we've got the coastal plain um, east of Richmond, which we call the Lower James. 
And uh, the, the James River is, is immense, um, you know, 340 miles long. The, the watershed is 10,000 square miles. And um, it really slices through the heart of Virginia. We've got about a third of the state's population that lives in Virginia, um, but that's really concentrated in the, the population centers like Richmond and Hampton Roads. Um, so you have these really, um, you can really have these amazing experiences out in the wilderness, out in nature, um, really just outside of the Richmond city limits. And, and even in places like Hampton Roads where you, some folks may think there, are, there isn't any natural land um, out there. there. There's quite a bit of really amazing places to explore in Hampton Roads um, between the state parks, the federal lands, um, but also some really amazing local parks that you can go and camp. Go ahead and hit the next slide, Justin. So I'm going to give you a little bit of information about each region now. So the Upper James is um, really gotten a strong following in recent years through the development of something called the Upper James Water Trail. Um, which flows about 64 miles through the Blue Ridge. Um, it starts at um, Iron Gate. Iron Gate is a place where the Jackson River and the Cow Pasture Rivers come together. And at that junction, that's where the James River officially begins. From there, it flows 340 miles down to the Chesapeake Bay. But at its, at its source, um, it goes through uh, these, these really high mountaintops. Um, you see bald eagles, river otters. That's a... a, a hammock camping setup that I had from years ago on an island um, that was uh, managed by Twin River Outfitters in the Upper James. It's just an incredible um, uh, place to explore and many, many camping opportunities abound. So Twin River Outfitters is one outfitter that, uh, that is based in Buchanan, Virginia. We'll try to give you some, um, some uh, information on a few options for folks you can go to to rent canoes and kayaks this evening. Wilderness Canoe Company is another one to check out as well. Um, notably, a good section of the Upper James Water Trail has been designated as a Virginia um, State Scenic River. So just sort of underscores how um, uh, important and how precious this area is, um, how undeveloped and, and really um, beautiful it is. Go ahead and hit the next slide, Justin. Um, this is a, a map that, that is um, better uh, perused in, in person or, or if you go to the website after tonight and check it out. But this is just an example of um, really how large the Upper James Water Trail is. But also you can see what a nice map this is um, that's been produced to kind of show off the resource. And you can go, um, just, just put it in the Google um, search, the Upper James Water Trail, you'll find a lot of information that is put out there by uh, Botetourt County to help you plan a trip on this section of the James. And again, um, you know, from Richmond, you're talking um, just you know two and a half, three hours drive to get up to Buchanan and really uh, explore this really beautiful place. Next slide. Okay, moving downstream. So the Middle James, again, this is more of the that Piedmont area transitioning from mountains to, um, to more of the hills, um, but still um, this is a non-tidal system. So the river is only flowing in one direction at this point on, on the course of the river. So we start in Lynchburg and the, the Middle James flows all the way down into the fall uh, line or the fall region of the James River in Richmond. And there's some really remarkable and, and important uh, places that you're gonna pass along the way. Um, the James River Bateau Festival is a, is a uh, sort of a locally famous event that happens every June. It's been happening since 1985. And it's a celebration of the, the history of these old wooden boats, these shallow bottom boats that were used to, to lug um, uh, goods up and down the canals um, of the James River um, before the railroads came in. So uh, th this, is, this was the preferred route of transporting goods um, um, in a previous point in history here in Virginia. And you can still see the, the remnants of the locks, the canals in a lot of places along the James as you float from uh, Lynchburg down to Richmond. Um, this photo in the bottom is actually a, a wooden bateau that James River Association had reconstructed a few years ago. And this is parked right at our office in Amherst, uh, right across the river from Lynchburg. Um, so we are uh, trying to work some historical interpretation um, into our educational programs, along with a lot of environmental science to talk about this, this um, neat history. Um, you've got places like the Hatton Ferry. That's the, that's the ferry operator we're seeing there in that photo. Uh, near the town of Scottsville. 
and there are some uh, really important uh, scenic river stretches in the Middle James as well, places like Seven Islands um, and just amazing places to, to explore and camp um, along with the wildlife. I'll mention James River State Park is a, is a great place to go. You can drive there, you can set up, set up a tent there and do just a half day float um, adjacent to the park. Powhatan State Park is another place that has canoe in options. And there's a whole host of outfitters that you can go to to plan a trip on the Middle James. Next slide. Um, again, I just wanted to show you a map um, to highlight this section. So from um, starting in Lynchburg and down to Richmond, you've got about 150, um, 160 river miles that you're covering, a large section and uh, not a lot of, of development. These, this is a really rural part of Virginia. So you're gonna see farms, you're gonna see um, uh, forested buffers and um, a really a unique place to explore. Next slide. Okay, so we've made our way through the mountains, through the Piedmont, through the, the uh, falls, um, the rapids of Richmond, and then we get to some quieter waters um, where we start to see the influence of tides. So actually at 14th Street in downtown Richmond, you can look upstream and see falls, look, look downstream from the bridge and see that the water is flat and tidally influenced. So about 110 miles from Richmond, um, the James River empties into the Chesapeake Bay and there are, um, a ton of, of historical sites, um, parks, um, and, and interesting wildlife to encounter along the river's course through that section. So um, Colonial National Historic Park in Williamsburg is of course um, a very famous place. Um, that's a photo there of the tall ships, the interpretive ships, um, replicas of the original um, vessels that came over to Jamestown from England. And you can um, see this history and, and explore it firsthand, but also you start to see things really change in the Lower James because you have the influence of the ocean. You have salt in the water. You have things like oysters, crabs, osprey, and you're going to really see um, a distinct change in the geography and in the wildlife that you're encountering. There are um, tons of parks, um, and we, I know we've got some folks on the call tonight that have probably done some multi-day trips. Um, you, can, you can really um, have some incredible experiences with a little bit of planning, um, working your way down river between all three segments and, and stop it along the way at some of these um, sites where you can camp. Um, one place I wanna throw out in the Lower James that's really neat is uh, Chickahominy Riverfront Park down in James City County. You've got um, bald cypress marshes that are just um, incredible. These are ancient um, trees, they grow just in a particular part of a, of a tidal freshwater marsh and um, just just a beautiful um, uh, marsh environment to explore. And, um, and actually, if you've ever seen um, the, the, the movie years ago of um, Jamestown, um, they actually filmed um, a lot of that in, um, in the Chickahominy watershed to sort of represent what um, uh, the, you know, the landscape looked like prior to European arrival. So the, the, the movie, The New World was all filmed um, in the Chickahominy Marsh to really show um, what a healthy marsh looks like. And that is still true today. We've got some really healthy, beautiful marshes in the lower Chickahominy that are um, well worth a trip to go um, and explore. Go ahead, next slide, Justin. Um, this is a nod to the National Park Service um, this is another map that I, I recommend you, you, can, you can drop in a Google search, look for the Lower James um, River Water Trail or the Captain John Smith Water Trail. The National Park Service has invested a lot of um, time and, and uh, money into developing these great resources to help plan trips. Um, there's, there's interpretive buoys that you can actually call on the Lower James and they'll give you some information about the area. Um, there's uh, all kinds of uh, suggestions for places to stop and explore. And of course, you've got an incredible mixture of history, um, cultural and natural um, uh, resources in the Lower James, um, really tying back to Jamestown and the formation of our country. All right, next slide. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to, to back to Justin so he can feed us into the next segment. Thank you for that wonderful and thorough overview of the, the James River and its watershed, Jamie. That was, that was awesome. Um, next up is Charles Johnson, and he's going to be talking about uh, the different types of camping that one can do along the James River. Charles, how are you doing? I'm doing quite well, Justin. 
Thank you for the great introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope everyone's gearing up and excited to get outdoors once this weather breaks. I'm um, really looking forward to talk about camping options. Uh, the James River has to be one of my favorite places uh, in the summertime, even outside of all the work that we do, just spending time on the river or near the river. So really excited to talk to you this evening about some camping options. We can go next slide. Awesome. <clears throat> so first we're gonna cover some tent camping. Um, tent camping ranges from those that have, you know, the eight person camping tent um, that only is put in your trunk and carried 10 feet to the campsite. Uh, those, you know, family fun events um, to where maybe you're uh, pulling your car up to a site or maybe you have a short walk to a site. Um, those are really great introductory ways for your you know, children to get out there, for students to kind of get their feet wet into camping. Um, and my favorite part about tent camping is the camaraderie that it takes to put those tents together. There's always so many poles and so many things that go into it. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to put an eight person tent together, uh, I challenge you to do that this summer. Um, so thinking about our camping sites that we like to use, um, when we are on the James, we kind of have two different options when we're leading our um, leadership expedition programs. We have those that are actual campgrounds. So a campground, we would consider that an area that has a cooking grill, an area that may have running water. And the most important about a campground, it must have a toilet. Um, so some key things for campgrounds. Then as we're talking about our primitive camping areas, um, our primitive camping areas are going to be lacking of those amenities. So you're not going to have your running water, you may not have cell service, and you may not have a toilet. Um, when we are doing our leadership expedition time on the river, we bring a uh, toilet, we call it the throne. Um, it rides on top of one of our canoes and uh, it's a special thing for us, especially those places that you don't have the luxury of a toilet. Um, some great areas in the um, Middle James, as Jamie was saying, James River State Park is a great place. Um, they have that canoe in campground where you can bring your canoes right into the landing, um, take your gear out and walk right over to a campsite. Um, other areas in the Upper James, you have Twin River Outfitters. Um, they have a beautiful facility at Eagle Rock um, and other facilities along the James. And one of my favorite uh, of their facilities is actually an Alpine. Um, and those are both accessible via the James River as well. Um, so as we're thinking about primitive camp camping as well as backcountry camping, they are fairly similar. Um, some other things that you may experience with backcountry back camping is smaller equipment. So all of that gear that you're carrying may go into one dry bag um, where you really are limited on the luxuries that you bring. You know, you may not have a huge stove or a grill. Um, you may have single burners. Um, that you're using to prepare your food. Um, but it's a really great experience. Um, if you've gotten your feet wet while at a campground and you kind of want to take it to the next level, I definitely would suggest some primitive camping. Um, some of my favorite areas in the middle James, you have James River Runners, they have a facility. Um, they do have a porter potty some ways, um, but I would still consider that almost primitive campground. Um, and then we're thinking about in the upper James, my favorite area is uh, there's a beach just above Balcony Falls, which is a section of rapids before you get to one of the first dams in um, Amherst County. Now, let's think about outside of the tents. Um, I've actually transitioned away from the tent in probably the last four years. Um, so all the camping that I do, if it's in a canoe or out of a car, I'm always bringing my setup for my hammock. Um, it's definitely more comfortable for me. Um, I don't prefer to sleep on the ground. Uh, the hammock, it actually gives you a nice underbreeze uh, in the summertime. Um, it has some, you know, that airflow. It's definitely one of my favorite ways to camp. Um, but, you know, with thinking of hammock camping, you know, you do have different setups. Um, a really popular brand is Enu. Um, a lot of people may be familiar with. Um, Hennessy is another uh, uh, hammock setup. Um, Hennessy is a good way to get in because all of their things kind of come together. There's really three key parts to your hammock setup. You have the actual hammock, which you lay in, you have the straps, 
And I think the number one most important thing is a bug net. Because if you don't have that, it's going to be pretty <laughs> unpleasant to be sleeping, uh, getting bit all night. Um, and the fourth, fourth thing that I would add if you're going to be out there for several days would be a rain fly to that. Thinking about RV camping, um, it is extremely popular in our state parks and other campgrounds. Um, so there's kind of three main categories when we're talking about our RVs. You have class A, B, and C. Um, class A would be like a bus type RV. Class B would be like your Ford Transit type vans. And then your class C is um, like a smaller cab with like a sleeper that kind of comes over. Um, and then you have your trailers and your trailers have a wide range. You have your travel trailers, you have your fifth wheel trailers, you have your toy haul trailers that have pop-ups. And then you also have those trailers that you can put into the pickup bed if you have a pickup truck. Really popular one in James too is the cabin access that we have specifically at James River State Park and a couple other privately owned facilities. Um, there's beautiful facilities to where you can um, paddle into especially James River State Park and just walk right up to the camp um, to where you have your whole cabin facility and they also have lodges there as well. So if you have other family that may be not um, savvy to paddle with you on the river, they can just drive in, park, all of you enjoy yourself at the lodge. And then lastly, we have our yurts. Yurts have become really popular in our state parks in the last five to six years. Um, yurts originally were um, a mobile unit that um, some nomadic people would use that would be traveling across Asia or the United States. Um, and now these yurts are more fixed facilities that are stationary, especially at our state parks. So within the state parks, they're um, just to kind of give you a rundown of what they look like. They're circular. They kind of have a TP top, but it's more rounded. Um, and in there, um, some have really nice facilities, you know, maybe some air conditioning, um, as well as, you know, bed facilities and things like that. Um, but they're really popular. Um, I definitely enjoy yurts as well. Um, so if you haven't had a chance, definitely check out some of the yurts that we have along the James. And then as we go into glamping, I'm going to kind of leave that one for Andy um, to talk about a little bit more next. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for letting me share a little bit about camping options. That was great, Charles. And I, I'll second um, what Charles said about hammocks. If you haven't tried sleeping in a hammock, give it a try. I, I really prefer it over sleeping on the ground. And and like Charles said, don't forget the rain fly and the bug net. You make that mistake once, you won't make it again. I agree. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Next up, we have our special guest, Andy Thompson of Riverside Outfitters, is gonna introduce glamping to us. And we were hoping that Andy was gonna be able to uh, participate in this webinar from um, Sharps Island in the James River. Unfortunately, the river uh, is a little high right now, so getting to Sharps Island is a little bit difficult, but Andy is joining us by phone and um, is gonna to talk to us about glamping. Andy, how are you doing? Well, Justin, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate your time. Absolutely, yeah. I wish I could be doing this uh, from the island, but that um, that big rainstorm we had a few days ago, they must have gotten way more than we did up in the headwaters because the river came way up, and now you definitely need a need a motorboat to get to the island. You can get there, but uh, you know, you'd have to come in from Ancara's Landing now. Wow. Wow. So just so folks can see, I'm, Andy, I'm showing them a photo of um, Richmond from 1865. And this is a photo that was taken on the south bank of the river, looking towards the north bank. And in the middle of the photo, towards the top of it, you'll notice uh, the Virginia State Capitol building. Um, and, and that's your point of reference. The island, the big island in the middle is Mayo Island. Um, and you'll see uh, remnants of the Mayo Bridge there, those pilings. And then the, the island that um, Andy is talking about, Sharps Island, is this island over here to the left, um, kind of upriver of, of uh, Mayo's Bridge. Andy, tell us a little bit about Sharps Island. Yeah, so I, I love that picture. That was actually one of the first guests we had out on the island, uh, found that and sent that to me. Um, and that is April of 1865. So that's not just 
you know, any pitcher at any time. I mean, that's an incredible um, sort of snapshot of the of that area at a, you know, an incredible time in Richmond's history. But, um, yeah, so as you can see, um, and, and Justin, tell me if you're um, moving through the slides, we can talk about the other pictures too, but it's had an incredible history um, probably since long before that picture was taken. But, um, you know, to bring it up to the present, uh, myself, and there's actually 10 families that uh, own Sharps Island. A friend of ours is a real estate agent in the Richmond area. She saw the listing uh, almost three years ago. It'll be three years in September and said there's only one person, uh, you know, crazy enough to, <laughs> to want to own this island. Turns out there's a few more, but she, she sent me the listing and we, uh, we figured it out. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of um, one thing has led to another. We've added some uh, facility amenities is probably too strong a word. We'll call them facilities. Um, they've been washed away once in the massive flood we had back in November. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a, an amazing adventure. Um, we put the island on Airbnb and hip camp, which is like Airbnb for campers. And, um, and, um, COVID has sort of supercharged, I think people's, um, you know, desire to get outside and people have really been looking around and have found it on those on those websites and it's become this incredible um, sort of getaway in the city. Um, it really is like, if you look at, um, if you were to do an Airbnb search or a hip camp search, you'll see that I think in May there are now four or five open days. If you wanted to rent the island in May or June, there's like four or five open days in, in either of those months. So it's just become this um, kind of oasis for people. It's really neat. That's amazing. I'm so I'm, I've got the photo of the platform that um, the canvas tent will be installed on. Tell people about this tent and uh, the amenities on Sharps Island. If, if anybody is interested in, in, in staying the night on Sharps Island. Well, yeah, that, you know, sort of dovetails with glamping. Um, we hope, although, you know, like any of these things, um, whether it's um, the word primitive or glamping, you know, it's sort of in the eye of the beholder and the, and the person that's out there. Um, we, um, over the past couple of years, had built up, um, like, the, the first thing we built was a, a 10 by 10 platform for people to put tents. Um, that is still there. Then we built a small A-frame cabin. Um, that got washed away in this past November's flood, but that was a super fun thing. People could ride out storms. They could put, you know, they could sleep there. Um, it had a swing wall that opened where, um, you know, you could open it up and, uh, you know, you could let the breeze blow through. We had a little free library on the island. Um, we had a, an outhouse. All of these things got washed away. We've rebuilt some of these things. And the next sort of iteration, we, we decided the cabin, you know, wasn't such a great idea. You know, it's obviously a matter of time before the next big flood. Um, and we found this really cool custom canvas tent company in montana who made this custom size uh glamping tent i think you have a slide for that justin um and the idea is you know when we know the next uh the next flood is on its way we can um we can you know get out there and uh take it down before before the, the river comes up that's great that's great so what what is your timeline on install? Do you think in in the near future? Yes, the the tent is out there. Honestly, we were hoping to have it up by then, um, by excuse me, by now. But the uh, the uh, the river just hasn't cooperated, so everything's out there. But it's a little bit of a project to put it up, and uh, that's that's kind of our next step. So anyone who's I would say, you know, wanting to head out there in the next couple of weeks, it'll be up there by then. That's great. And a quick search of Airbnb, you should be able to find it. That's great. Hey, Andy, before... Yeah, and from uh, this, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'll let you, you speak. You know, I was just going to say the sort of like, um, to talk about glamping more generally, you know, it's, it's generally sort of um, seen as a... Um, it's like camping, but with, uh, you know, sometimes pretty significant amenities. So I don't know if, um, 
if Shark Island kind of rises to that level. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea is usually that you've got, um, it's sort of like roughing it, but in a fancy way, right? So you, you've got uh, really nice beds, um, toilets, um, kind of um, a little more concierge service. Um, but again, sort of in the eye of the beholder, it depends on the location too, right? I mean, there's some amazing glamping options out there um, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I wouldn't say we're there yet, but that's sort of um, an option that we're sort of considering offering people. Yeah, we've we've seen a glamp site uh, pop up um, on the Upper James River Water Trail. Um, it's actually operated by Twin River Outfitters, and as Andy was describing, it's it's really a place where somebody canoeing along the James can canoe up to it, and it has amenities so that you know it really um, you know takes away the need for you to pack a lot of supplies and bring a lot of supplies with you on your 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 camping trip. Um, it's just a little bit more comfortable than, you know, your typical campground. Um, and it is a, um, a, a trend in camping that we're seeing, you know, across the country. Hey, Andy, before yeah, we you. move on, I was, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about Riverside Outfitters. Um, and so folks know Riverside Outfitters is one of our, uh, wonderful outfitters here in the city of Richmond, um, that provide opportunities to get on, on the river. You want to speak about Riverside Outfitters a little, little bit, Andy? Yeah, thank you, Justin. I mean, first though, I you know those guys. I've actually stayed at that campsite you're describing that the Twin Rivers Outfitters and the Mays Brothers have. They operate out of Buchanan, and it is super cool. I mean, you paddle in, and they've got you know lots of things taken care of for you. They do an incredible job up there. Um, I wish we in Richmond had some of the sort of camping uh, options that they've developed up there. But what we do have is, you know, the best whitewater on the James, um, certainly for, for a, like a long stretch. I think the falls are, what, seven miles, six, seven miles that we have through town. Yeah, and, and Riverside offers anything from rafting, you know, class three to four whitewater, um, depending on the, on the river level, to stand-up paddleboard and kayak rentals on some of that, lo- um, some of that water. Um, and one of the neatest things, honestly, about the James and Richmond is that it's not just white water. You know, there's, there's flat water pools in places like the wetlands and above pony pasture, Huguenot flat water. I mean, you can, you can go from an absolute novice paddler to a, you know, white water, you know, John Lugville quality white water, Olympic white water downtown, um, you know, within a couple of miles of each other and, and, and Riverside services the whole area. Yeah, pretty special what we have here in Richmond. Well, thank you so much for, for and um, I'm hoping to get out and, and visit Sharps Island uh, in the future. Hey, Justin. We, we got to have you, Justin. Yes. We have a quick question for Andy before he's done about Sharps Island. Okay. Um, Andy, can can people paddle out just to visit Sharps Island, or do you need to rent a facility to go out there? No, we we uh, we would love to have people just paddle out. I mean, that's the way it was. I mean, there's we're not. Uh, I wouldn't say any of us is super comfortable with the idea of like uh, you know it's my private island or we you know we own an island. It's true, but at the same time, you know. I'm like, right now, I guarantee you there are fishermen down there. And if they can't get to the island because of the river, they will, you know, soon enough. So, you know, uh, yes, absolutely paddle out there. Have fun. If you if you see some people who are out there camping, you know, um, obviously just sort of respect that, they, that they're there um, having, having paid for that, you know, night and that experience. But please go enjoy, especially this time of year. It's an amazing um when the water comes down, you know, there's shed and striped bass fishing, and it's it's right in the center of all the, um, the best fishing in Richmond and also some incredible um, bird life because the fish, you know, bald eagles, ospreys, cormorants, everything. Hey, and before you go, tell us about the, uh, the art installation on the island. Oh, yeah. So um, among the many sort of... Uh, I don't know. There, there was a couple of us when we first bought the island. We, it sort of popped into our heads, like, how cool would it be 
um, to sort of commission a work of art or multiple works of art where there's almost this treasure hunt element, right? Uh, to, to go find it, to see this work of art, you've got to, you know, you got to earn it a little bit. You've got to go paddle um, to this island in the middle of the river and discover it. And um, we took Ed Trask out there, you know, the well-known muralist, and um, we had talks with him. And um, there's a, and turned out um, we found a local artist who's just amazing. His name's Keith Edwards. And what he does is um, found object art, right? So he's, a, he's mostly a sculptor, although he's also a painter. And he creates these amazing works of art out of found objects. Um, and we commissioned an artwork. And he, um, it is, it is on the island right now. If you go on our Instagram account, which is Sharps Island RVA, you can see pictures of it. And it is a, um, this massive, um, fisherman called Edwards. And it's named after a famous African American found object artist named Melvin Edwards. And it's this, um, just incredible, massive fisherman. And he's sort of caught in this, in, in, you know, this dynamic moment of just having hooked a fish. And he's sitting on the upstream end of the island, um, anchored into the granite bedrock um and it's absolutely worth going to see if um if you want to go check it out um so that was uh, kind of a dream come true when when keith was able to put it all together out there so cool so cool well thanks again andy and um just so everybody knows you know, check out sharps island on airbnb and, and feel free to uh explore it when you get the chance yeah thank you so much guys all right, uh, next up, we're gonna talk about um, one of the James River Association's more unique education programs, the James River Leadership Expeditions. Um, and I wish, I wish I had had the opportunity to participate in a program like this when I was in high school. And um, my colleague, Julia Carson is gonna tell us more. So Julia, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. Um, my name is Julia Carson. I'm an environmental educator with the James River Association. Um, I'm also one of the um, leaders in this James River Leadership Expedition. I'm really excited to be debuting this program this summer. Um, if you're familiar with our previous programs, we had the Leadership Academy and the expedition separate. Um, this year they will be combined due to some funding um, issues. Um, but we're really excited to have this program combined this year. Um, you can flip to the next slide, Justin. Awesome. So this is a year-long leadership experience for high school students. We take rising eighth graders through rising 12th graders. Um, so it is a year-long experience. Over the summer, we would meet your students, take them out on the river for about a week. Um, they'll be camping, canoeing, learning lots of leadership skills with us meeting all of the other people in the program. And then there will be three other times that they're meeting with us throughout the year. So, um, oh yeah, thank you Mason putting that in chat. I was just about to do that. Um, we are taking applications as of now. Um, we'll be taking them probably through May. So if you have a high school student that is interested in being outside, this is an excellent program for them. Um, students are committing to helping communities in the James River watershed. So. Um, they'll learn lots of leadership things along the way, but one of the biggest aspects of this program is they will be developing a capstone project at the end of the year. Um, this leadership expedition program is funded by Luckstone Quarry, and they have a leadership program within um, Luckstone, and they um, like for us to have the students build this like community capstone project. So. Um, some examples of projects in the past, our students have made signs for public parks. Um, I've had a few students teach some um, elementary school uh, classes about um, different environmental issues. Um, we've had students um, building compost bins for certain areas, gardens, planting trees. Um, it's just a really great program. Justin, you can go ahead and flip to the next slide. Um, not only are they doing all of this leadership um, program things, but they're also just meeting really good friends. Um, all of our expedition participants can say that they definitely made great friends along the way. Um, they are also meeting environmental professionals along the way as well. So if we were to stop at a campsite, we might talk to a park ranger um, at James River State Park. We'll um, hopefully meet a park ranger and then also go on a hike with him. 
Um, they'll meet lots of people from the James River Association staff, as well as Luxstone, and then hopefully some other environmental professionals along the way. Um, they'll be learning lots of things about the river, so all about the wildlife, the history of the river. We'll be doing water quality testing, um, just so many different things along the way during the expedition pro portion and then throughout the Leadership Academy. Um, yeah, and along the way, they'll learn about different environmental careers. Um, it's a great thing to put on resumes, great thing for college applications, job applications. Um, it's a very, very unique experience. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I believe my email is somewhere in here, but I'll put it in the chat again, um, just so that you all have it. And then Charles is also heading up the program with me. So feel free to, um, yeah, Genevieve posted in the chat, this will actually be a bilingual program this year, which we're really excited about. We have a couple students that are Spanish speaking and that will be on the program. Um, and we still have lots of availability. So if you have high school students or know someone that would be interested, definitely reach out. Um, Mason put the link to the website in the chat. Um, we do have an online application this year, but if you're not quite ready to fill out the application and have some questions, my email is there as well. Um, I do have a fun video to show you all about our expedition. I think it gets people kind of excited about it and shows some of the fun aspects of the program. High school. Julia, that, that video was put together by an expedition alumni? It was. It was actually a James River Leadership Academy student um, for her project, her capstone project. She made a video to advertise expedition. And I think it is so well portrayed. Um, we have so much fun when we do these programs. Um, I saw a couple questions in the chat. Um, I'm definitely going to answer some at the end too, but yes, that was at Jump Rock. It's in the middle of the James. <laughs> um, and I'd be happy to share the video as well um, if you are trying to convince some of your high school students to join the program. Um, awesome. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and I can also answer some questions in the chat or at the end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julie. That was awesome. Uh, like I said, um, you know, if you have, if I had the opportunity to participate, participate in a program like that when I was in high school, um, I would have absolutely loved it. So if you know any high school students who may be candidates uh, for participating in one of the expeditions, please uh, share the application with them. And so um, with that, we figured we'd um, talk a little bit about how to plan a multi-day expedition um, and Charles Johnson, we're gonna hear from him on how to go about doing so. So Charles, take it away. Awesome, thanks so much once again. Um, I am a raving fan of our James River Leadership Expedition. So please, please, please do spread the word. Um, amazing experience. Um, so thanks again. Um, looking forward to sharing some knowledge about planning a trip. Um, so here are three key roles um, that we follow as, you know, as we're planning the James River Leadership um, Expedition, as well as any of our other programs. First and foremost, um, before you go out there, do your research. Um, the James River is a really friendly river. 
uh, in sections. But if you, uh, let's say, decide to plan a trip, maybe you're from Chesterfield and you want to paddle to Richmond. Um, you know, some people may try to do that, you know, maybe from Robius Landing to, let's say, Pony Pasture. But most paddlers know in that section there, there's a dam. Um, and knowing that um, comes with doing your research. Um, so when in doubt, scout is a, a big thing for me um, as I am on the river, um, as well as contacting your local outfitters. Uh, Riverside Outfitters is a great outfitter to contact. Um, they provide you with water temperature, water levels, um, the, how fast the river is moving. Um, they provide you with maps to show you where specific mm -hmm. rapids are. Um, so really please plan um, by doing your research prior to getting out there. Um, if you are going with a group of friends, you know, my thing is I like to think about um, two months out. So if I'm planning, I'm looking two months out, looking at my friends' calendars, looking at my calendars, and the same when we're doing it for our, um, you know, programs with our students. We're planning two months out. We're contacting the campsites, making sure we have all of our gear and kind of moving in that direction. <clears throat> Um, as we said before, Twin River Outfitters is a great uh, resource for you while on the river and near the river. They have a lot of maps um, as well as um, Riverside Outfitters. Uh, Walkabout Outfitters is another great resource um, that sells different gear. Um, they are really helpful when it comes to planning trips as well. Um, next is securing a map or maps. Um, <clears throat> I always like to go with the favor of carrying two. Um, one <clears throat> could be a paper map, but once it rains, um, we all know once things get wet, pretty hard to use those things. So you always should have maybe a laminated map as well. We all have cell phones. Something that you can do is download the map um, on Google Maps. Um, they do a pretty good job of showing the James River. They don't really show features, um, but it's you know important to kind of know how many miles it is to the next takeout. Um, it's really important um, in the upper James, um, it really has been helpful that they have now mile markers on there because some people will put in and do a float maybe in a, um, an inner tube and not really realize how long it takes to go five miles in the inner tube. It's a little bit different than paddling five miles. <clears throat> Permitting wise, uh, we are fortunate on the James where you don't need a permit to be on the river. Um, we always suggest while in the um, downtown section of the James, uh, anytime you're on the river, you should always have a PFD on a personal flotation device um, and really be an expert or be with an expert prior to going out there. Another key thing with planning multi-day trips is establishing trip roles. Um, this is really important. Um, if you are going out for the first time, I would say have someone that has a lot of experience be a trip lead for you. That trip lead, they probably have the experience of being on the river. Um, being on the James at six feet is a lot different than being on the James at three feet. Um, and the James is really amazing because the river levels change a lot depending on how much rain that we get, kind of the time of the year and so forth. Um, so always, you always want to have a trip lead, um, really important, that person, as let's say it was me, first things first is safety. Um, so they are the one that's going to assess the risk. They're going to one that they think about the worst case scenario when it does come to weather. They think about the inherent dangers that it comes with when paddling. Um, also thinking about medical issues, um, someone that has the CPR, first aid, wilderness responder. Um, and also thinking about how far you are away from maybe the local hospital or even the local takeout. Um, really important things for your trip lead to be thinking of. You always want to have some person that is a gear person. So some person that's going to make sure everyone has a tent, a sleeping bag, a sleeping pad, um, and everything else that is required when it comes to camping. Um, you also want to have somebody that prefers to cook. Uh, we all need to eat. Uh, while we're on our leadership expeditions, we're thinking of three meals a day. Um, so you always want to have a cook. Um, I like another thing. Um, the last two roles that I think of is someone that can be classified as the medic. Um, so if first aid happens, you know, that person can be 
uh, first and foremost to the scene um, and really establishing um, a chain of command. Um, and then you always want to bring some fun people. You don't want a whole bunch of boring people on the river with you. Uh, so don't forget to bring the fun folks with you. Um, thinking about our gear checklist. Um, oh, so prior to going to the gear checklist, um, our students on a James River Leadership Expedition, each day they're assigned with a role. Um, so one day we'll have a trip lead um, who's looking at the maps, telling us how far we're going, telling us where we're going to stop for lunch, maybe what features that we'll have um, on the river. Um, and then you'll also have your camp cooks. Um, we usually have two students that will be establishing like what we'll be eating, talking about all the options for food. Um, you also have a student scientist um, that will be measuring abiotic water quality while we're on the trip. Um, and there's a couple more roles, but um, we just like to instill these values of establishing trip roles to the students so that they can carry on and be professionals um, with their friends or family as they go out onto the river. Creating a gear checklist is extremely important. Um, you don't want to get out there and you have everything. You have your food, you have your PFD, you have your paddling vessel, um, you have everything and you forget the paddle. Um, you don't want to be that person that shows up to the river and you don't have a way to paddle your vessel. Um, so creating that checklist, starting from the smallest things in your personal gear um, to comfort gear, making sure you have your medicines and so forth. Don't forget sunblock, you know, your bug sprays and all those little things are really important. Um, a resource that I like to go to when creating a gear checklist is NRS. Um, on there, they have lists for personal gear. They have gear that you would take rafting, gear that you would take um, canoeing. Um, so NRS, and if you go to gear checklist there, um, a really great resource for any time uh, that you're getting on the river. Um, excellent. Um, that is what I have, um, you know, always when I'm on the river, um, I like to think about, you know, using my five senses um, you know, you look at the river features, you hear for those river features, um, you make sure everyone uh, is comfortable with going through that section of rapids. Um, as Andy was saying, in some sections of the James, we have class three and four rapids, which is pretty big water. Um, so definitely make sure you do your research, properly plan, um, and great outfitters. Um, the James River uh, association, we have an outfitter in Amherst that can put you on a river and pick you up. Great first experience, as well as Twin Rivers um, and other um, rafting uh, companies here in the city of Richmond. Um, so thanks so much. Hope you guys will be able to benefit from that. Um, but there's so many great resources out there for you. Um, and if you do have any other questions, I would love to answer those at the end. Hey, quick question for you, Charles. Um, yes. In terms of paddlecraft, um, what is your uh, preferred paddlecraft for a multi-day expedition? My favorite paddlecraft is by far a canoe. Um, I love the accessibility um, to put things into your canoe. Um, I love the variation of you can either sit down in a canoe kind of on your bottom. You can even go through rapids on your knees to where you have more of uh, a center of gravity. Um, and, you know, people do call it the divorce sport, but I think it really builds team camaraderie um, working with a tandem person in there or another person you knew. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, Charles and Julie are our resident expedition experts. So if you have any questions about the James River Leadership Expeditions or planning a multi-day expedition yourself, please reach out to them. They're wonderful resources. Thanks again, Charles. Yeah, no problem at all. It's my pleasure. That brings us to um, camping on the James Tools. And I'm happy to introduce Mason Manley, uh, who is a University of Richmond Bonner Scholar, um, who's been placed with the James River Association um, for um, almost all of his college career. We are very fortunate to have him on board. He has recently created a uh, tool that will help folks uh, plan camping trips along the James and its tributaries. Mason, how are you doing this evening? I'm good. Thanks, Justin. It's great to see so many of you here tonight. Um, just want to spend a couple of minutes before we move to our Q&A portion, just um, showing you a few of the tools that we have available 
when you do start planning these multi-day trips. So I'm going to show you how to get to all these tools just to make sure you can find these after the webinar. So the first and the newest tool I'm going to go over is the Camping on the James portal. So to head here, you want to head to Explore the James on our website. And our website is thejamesriver.org, if you didn't already know that. And then go ahead and hit Camping on the James. And then if you just hit this image right at the top here, it will open the portal. So once we have this open, I'm going to show you a few examples of how you can use this to potentially find some campgrounds or campsites across the watershed. So you'll see a few key things here. You see the watershed outline, so you can kind of orient yourself as you use this tool. And down the side, we have a list of all the campgrounds and campsites that we have in our database. Um, all, all of these are within the watershed. So there's a few ways you can go about using this tool. The first way would be to just kind of look at the list and you could potentially identify, identify somewhere you like based on its you know, approximate location or maybe the small image we have. And you can always go ahead and just click on the image or click on the site itself and the, the map will go ahead and zoom you in. And then to get back to the start, you can just go ahead and hit home and that will zoom you back out. The second way you can use this is just manually, you can look through the watershed and you see the little uh, like campground icons here. So you can go ahead and click on this one. So we'll use Sharps Island as an example, seeing as we were talking about that just a little while ago. And once you hit on the point, um, you'll see the GPS coordinates, which can be quite useful when you're planning a trip. Um, if you're not, ne you're not necessarily going to be using road directions if you're if you're traveling on the road on the river. So you have the GPS coordinates, also usually a street address, sometimes a phone number, but you'll always have a website. You can go ahead and just click view on there, and it will take you to the most applicable website to either reserve that place or contact that place. So here we have um, Andy's Airbnb page for the, for Sharps Island to go ahead and book that. So moving back here, just an additional um, way to use this, you can go ahead and, and hit the little search icon up here if you want to find somewhere in the vicinity of an address. So I'll use the address of our office just to go ahead and, and zoom in. If we get it, let's see. There we go. And then once you've zoomed in, as, just like before, you can go ahead and kind of zoom out and see what you have in the in the vicinity of where you want to be. Again, we're, go we're going to have Sharp Style and probably as our, our nearest spot. You can go ahead and click on the, the um, point again. A few other useful tools. So if we will zoom into Sharp Island, take a closer look. You can go ahead up here and click this um, base map icon and, and change what you're looking at. So you can go ahead and switch to imagery and get, get more of a feel for how the area looks. Um, the river will be um, represented by the blue, so you might not necessarily see the river itself, but you can see all, all the local surrounding area. So that's the first tool that we have. And just when you do use this tool, this is brand new. So everyone on this call, you're all the first people to find out about this tool. So if you do have any feedback, just go ahead and hit this, um, this icon up here, uh, if it connects. Well, I'm having a connection issue, but for you, when, once you click that, that will open a, a box here and you can go ahead and enter your feedback. Um, that was working earlier, so it definitely works. Then the second tool that we'll briefly look at is less to do with camping, but more just about general river access. Um, so we'll go ahead and head back to the main homepage of our website, and you can go ahead and hit virtual resources and James River Maps. And I did link this in the chat earlier, so this is just generally a very useful page to go ahead and visit. Someone was asking in the chat about resources for the Middle James. If you scroll down here, you can see we have the upper, middle, and lower, and we have lots of maps linked that you can go ahead and dive into. But what I want to briefly show you is um, the James River Explorer. So you just go ahead, hit this image up here, and you're, you're going to be able to access the Explorer. Let me just move this out of the way. There we go. So this is going to show you most of the public access sites that we have across the watershed. So let's just as a brief example, say we're interested in fishing, you can go ahead and ch check fishing off on the list of activities on the left here. And you'll get all the fishing icons pop up, you can go ahead and zoom in, take a look at some of these, click on them and get some more details. And just like we could before we have information here, a website you can access by hitting more info. 
And you can also go ahead and change the, the base map to get a, a better idea of the area you're looking at. So I'll switch to imagery and zoom in on this site. You can click zoom to, and it's gonna zoom you, zoom you in closer. And you can take a look at what the area looks like and um, how accessible you think it will be. So you can see the, the road and the local area there. And again, a tool I did forget to mention on the Camping on the James portal that's also present here is the measuring tools. If you want to measure something on the river, you can just go ahead and select this tool, click, and then double click once you've finished your line. And that's going to help you just measure distances along the river, um, just to generalize the distance that you're looking at between sites. And that's also available by clicking the ruler icon on the Camping on the James portal that we just looked at previously too. So those are the two um, big tools we have for you when, as you're planning your trips and, and finding these access points. And something I did want to briefly mention that um, was relevant to what Charles was just discussing, um, we do also have the James River Rundown Challenge, um, which is a challenge to, to paddle off 340 miles of the river. Um, and you can go ahead and kind of potentially plan a, a, a multi-day expedition around that challenge and, and hit complete the application there. And I'll go ahead and share that link in the chat just for ease of use um, in a minute here. But that's all, that's all I have for um, our tools. I hope you get a chance to use them. Especially the Camping on the James, on, uh, the Camping on the James portal is brand new. I hope you find some useful information on there and, and leave us some feedback if you have new sites you want to have added or new features that you think would be cool to, to have in there. But that's all for me. Thanks so much, Mason. Those tools are wonderful, and and just so everybody knows, you know, Mason by creating that that camping on the James tool, um, he's really, um, you know, kind of bringing our camping on the James webpage to the next level, and making it even easier for folks to um, you know plan their their camping trips. Um, so thank you for all of the work that you put into um, that tool, Mason. It's it's much appreciated. And I saw a lot of feed, good positive feedback coming through in the chat. Um, while you were presenting. So that brings us to the end of our webinar. Uh, and we do have some time uh, to answer questions that folks uh, have. And um, just a reminder that um, you can answer or you can submit questions via the Zoom chat box. And uh, Aaron Hiller of the James River Association will um, uh, be prompting us with some questions. And just to break the ice, um, just wanted to ask uh, a few of my colleagues where their favorite place to camp on the James is, is and why. And um, so Jamie responded, and you already heard from him this evening, that Chickahominy Riverfront Park in James City County um, is one of his favorite spots uh, because of those beautiful uh, tidal marshes, um, you know, pretty close to pristine. Um, it's just a very scenic part of the James River watershed. And you heard from Charles, he talked about Balcony Falls and, um, camping on national forest land um, just downriver of the town of Glasgow. It's a scenic stretch of the James River. Um, and, you know, if you're if you're up for, uh, you know, an amazing overnight adventure uh, on national forest land, um, you know, paddle through Balcony Falls and, uh, you know, camp there right above the falls. Uh, and then the next morning run those class three rapids and, and just, you know, have a great day of it. Um, Julia, um, Julie's favorite place to camp is Horseshoe Flats Campground near Scottsville. And Scottsville is a wonderful river town. So you can camp at Horseshoe Flats, walk over a bridge um, that goes downtown uh, in the town of Scottsville. And you can have dinner at one of their restaurants. Uh, there's actually a brewery there. Um, it's in a small river town, but there's enough um, there to, to make it an interesting overnight um, or long weekend um, stay. And um, as Jamie described earlier, the middle James River is, um, is just a scenic stretch of the James River. And then my favorite place to, to camp um, is James River State Park in Buckingham County. Um, I, I love their, their riverfront uh, campsites uh, as well as their cabins. Um, it's a very family friendly uh, place to stay um, and it has a variety of uh, accommodations. Um, so if you're you're looking for, you know, an easy place to to get to and and spend a night or two, um, check out James River State Park um, this spring or summer. All right, um, Aaron, 
do we have any questions? Yes, thank you, Justin. And thanks to all the presenters for just this wonderful information. And I really appreciate Mason and Julia keeping up with links in the chat. Um, just a couple of questions. I'll go back to the first one I caught. Are fish caught from the James safe to eat? Hey, Tammy, how about you uh, take that one? Sure, sure. Yeah, this is a common question and it's a good one. Um, the, the, the answer is, is a bit mixed, unfortunately. Uh, the river is, is uh, by really many measures, much, much healthier than it was, say, 10, 20, 30 uh, years ago. And that's because we've, we've done a lot of really great work. There's been a lot of investments at the state, federal, and local level to, to, to do things on farms and our cities that are improving water quality. Uh, but there are still some, some lasting issues um, notably PCBs, which is a, a, a toxic type of pollutant that um, are still manifesting themselves in, in fish tissue in certain parts of the river. So um, by and large, yes, it is safe to eat the fish, but if you uh, are to look this up on um, the, the state website managed by the Department of Wildlife Resources, you'll see that some fish um, are more likely to accumulate PCBs, which is an acronym for polychlorinated biphenyls um, than other fish. So catfish, um, bottom feeders, um, older fish, they're all more likely to have those kinds of toxins. Um, we'll drop a link um, in the chat bar in just a minute that points you to some more resources, but um, there is guidance that's put out by Virginia that says you should avoid eating more than say, you know, two or three meals of um, a particular size fish or a particular species of fish. But um, I will say, as long as you are um, aware, um, you're, you're conscientious about this sort of thing, um, it is safe to eat the fish. Many people do. Um, the, the James is an incredibly productive place and a lot of uh, seafood resources from oysters to crabs to striped bass um, comes from the James and is safe to eat. <clears throat> and um, you know, one thing about PCBs, Virginia is, is just now taking some important steps to create a cleanup plan for PCBs in the tidal James and in the um, upper and middle James that just actually rolled out a few months ago. And so we're hopeful that in another um, year or so when that plan is finalized, we'll see some really important movement towards uh, cleaning up some of the sources of those toxins. Thank you, Jamie. Our next question is, are there any plans to develop primitive camping options between Lynchburg and James River State Park? It would be awesome. I agree. Yeah, great suggestion. And um, to my knowledge, there aren't any imminent plans, um, but we are working with a group of folks in the Lynchburg area to um, plan improved river access along the, the James River and the James River Heritage Trail. Um, and some primitive camping options could, could be um, something that's considered as part of that planning effort and something that I will certainly pass along to um, our Lynchburg colleague, Rob Campbell, um, so that he can be thinking about that with our partners up there in that stretch of uh, the watershed. Great question. Thanks, Justin. I think the last one we have for now is uh, does the JRI website have suggested overnight canoe routes, as in um, putting in camping sites and taking out? Maybe um, Mason can answer that. I, my, I don't believe it does have suggested uh, overnight camping routes, but that's something that we could um, create um, as a resource. Um, I, I know that you know those of us that are uh, participating in the webinar tonight could probably provide you with some guidance. Um, you know, the Upper James River Water Trail, um, there, are, there are numerous options uh, for overnight routes. And if you reach out to Twin River Outfitters, um, they could um, lead you in the right direction um, and, and, and really provide you with the, the distance that you're looking for with the accommodations that you're looking for. And um, remember, they do have those glamp sites, um, which are, would be cool to check out. Mason, do you, are you aware of anything on our website that um, has any guidance on yeah. that front? We, we don't currently have any kind of itineraries per se on the website. Um, as, I, as I shared earlier, we do have like quite a few maps that, that can be useful in, in planning your own trips. And we do have several outfitters across the watershed that all can help you with 
with that. Um, but that being said, with, with the new resources we have coming out regarding camping and everything, I think that's definitely a logical next step that we will be developing in the future. So I would keep your eyes peeled on our website um, in the future and we'll, we'll probably have something up there. Thank you, Mason. Um, one just came in. Are there any outfitter groups or camping options in the Hampton Roads area below Chickahominy Riverfront? There are. Um, the one that comes to mind is located at Fort Monroe National Monument, uh, the colonies. Um, and the cool thing about this campground is that it's where it's located where the James River meets the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so it's a pretty special place. And, and Fort Monroe, of course, has um, some significant um, history. Um, so that's a place worth checking out. Um, Charles and Julia, are you aware of any other options down that way? No. Um, thinking of Chip Oaks State Park, um, but they don't necessarily have camping options um, like on the James, um, but they do have um, facilities for rent, um, some like bunk houses and things like that. And uh, just a follow up to that, can you camp at Fort Monroe? Do you guys know? If, yeah, if you, um, if you visit that, um, uh, the colonies uh, campground uh, website. I think that there it is. I think Julia just shared it. Um, I think that is uh, the best option uh, for camping at Fort Monroe. Thanks, Justin. That's and all while, I got for now. And I'll just say, while it's just slightly outside of the watershed, you've got First Landing State Park too. Um, uh, also a, a really unique place to check out. That's a, that's a facility that's managed by our state agency, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. I ditto that, my favorite place to camp. Um, and if you're looking for further outside the watershed, um, False Cape is a area to where you can paddle into off of Back Bay, um, just above the North Carolina line, one of my other favorite state parks, but outside the watershed. Great suggestions. If we don't have any other questions, um, I, I want to thank everybody who has uh, tuned in this evening uh, to, to learn about camping along the James. And I encourage you all to reach out to us um, and, you know, pick our brains about any questions about camping that you may have. And I hope that you all get out and about this year and, and explore uh, different areas of the, the watershed that you may not have visited before. So thanks again for participating and um, have a good evening.